Okay. I did know I did not know that Batman was a reader like the far right. Oh. Yeah, he just leans on the wall and reads. That's you, isn't it? <laughs> that's all I do. That's exactly what I do. I lean on the wall. I put on the costume, I lean on the wall, and then I read. Just just read. Exactly what I do. It yeah, looks probably... look like they're all going to about to fall over, doesn't it? It's like they're leaning the whole thing. Yeah, is well, leaning over. you're leaning too much, but you're on the float. You're not even on the ground. You're just floating. <laughs> Very cool. Anyway, very cool. continuing on. There you Continue go. On. So that's what I see every day now. See, I look up and I see all the boxes. Hey, the, those bookends, didn't, is, didn't Mary give you that? She did. Yeah, they look really cool. They it's you. Cool. It's all you. Yeah. Oh. Oh. Howdy, howdy. I made it. Oh, you made Yay. it. So we don't have to waste it all. No more time wasting. Sorry. I did just, I've got a bit of a crazy day here today. So. Okay. okay. Off we go. Here we go. Yep. Uh, good morning, good evening, good afternoon, everybody out there in Clarion Live land. This is the Clarion Live weekly webinar. See, yeah. learn, share. <laughs> learn and share it. Yeah, if you're wearing the shirt, it's see, learn, share. Uh, this is number 533. Today is October wow. the 11th, 2019. Clarion date 79910. All webinars are recorded <laughs> and available at clarionlive.com. Um, you can join us on Skype. If you have questions, we monitor that sporadically and the webinars are now live streaming on youtube you can go to youtube.com slash clarion live and watch it there if you want to and uh we also there, there's a chat there too and i kind of look over there once in a while as well you do so there you i do okay. all right what else we got oh here we go we have hosts Host. Our, hey. hey we should get some pictures from the the CITC oh, and put them up. Put it up there. Yeah. No, I was good. I just, I just been extremely busy, so I haven't had much time to work on the, uh, on the slides. But I'm, I'm thinking about it, changing them up a uh -oh. little bit. Uh oh, uh oh. I'm still voting for bobbleheads. <laughs> that could happen next week if I, if I can clear up like an hour somewhere, or half hour really. Anyway, Arnold's with us, as you heard, um, and his mic is working. His headset's working. That's always a bonus. Mm -hmm. John, that's me. I'm with us. Lisa is not with us today. Bruce is with us for a short period of time. Hello, Bruce. Hello, Such everyone. Your, uh, hey, did you cut your hair yet? No, not yet. I'll send a okay. pic when I do. Okay. You'll look respectable again, will you? Well, he just wants he wait. just wants to be donatable. I understand. I understand why. Yeah, you know, is it, it's a very good cause, it's a very good thing to do. Uh, yet, at time, ultimately, it makes you look a, a little less uh, prim and proper than you normally do, Bruce. Uh, you see, but who wants to be prim and proper? I eh? suppose. Yes, exactly. Uh, you know, if you can't be what you, like not prim and proper. Yes. Well, well, why, why go with a green when you can go against it? Yeah, exactly. I wanted to. I wanted to look like Gordon. No. Mm, there you go. <laughs> there you go. And then Mike obviously is here because you can hear him speaking. But hi, everybody. Training, and if he, yeah. Uh, and, you know, I've, I've almost given up. I've almost just assumed that I'm always going to be a low man on the totem pole. That's just the way See, it's going to work, I think. That's part of the thing. If you give up, I mean, then obviously you'll never be. Well, I, okay, fine. We look, we look for commitment. We look for commitment. Uh, uh, is yeah. No commitment. Well, I, hey, I'm already married. Like, do I, do I have to commit more than that? Yes. Uh, yes. Okay. <laughs> okay. Anyway, we have rules. All attendees are muted. That means we can't hear you. Type your questions in the questions box. We will read them to the presenter if you want to speak. We encourage you to do so. Please raise your hand and type in the question box. Finally, don't make too many rules. Is there a very important reason why? You know why? Because the more rules you have, the more you need to break them. I know. And I've made a different rule every week for 10 years. And it's, I don't know, I'm running out of rules. <laughs> Well, I, I can. All, I'll maybe I'll throw a few your way. You can uh, just okay. pick, cherry pick a few of those. That's that would be helpful. All right, things you need to know. Announcements coming up. Future presentation. Mike Hansen is with us, and he'll be talking about multi-threaded programming. It's extremely important to know about that. Next week, don't know. Week after that, don't know. 
minutes. There you go. Someone could help us with that if you have an idea for a presentation or you would like to present in the next couple of weeks <coughs> or ever, just drop us a line and then we'll get you scheduled in. To help out your fellow clarionaires. And don't stop there. Just because it says October. It's true. That's reach. Count. November and December also. Right. Oh, November 1st, we have one from a fellow Clarion developer that wants to show his stuff. Oh, cool. It's going to be really cool. It's going to be about auctioning. No, no. Is it? No. Yeah. Looking yeah, he has an auction program. But it, but it yeah. does all sorts of live things. Yeah, Internet live stuff. Yeah. yeah. So we thought people might be thrilled to see something like that. All oh, in Clarion. Cool. Yeah. Why are we whispering? I don't know. Uh, we don't want we don't want everybody to know. <laughs> no, we do want everybody to know. Oh, 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 okay, 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 oh, okay. Oh, okay. Change okay. your tune. Change your tune. This is this is why Mike's still in training. All right. So uh no Antis user group meeting did not have one. We had an open webinar and we had a user group meeting. Oh, that was so good. <laughs> all of them all of them are streaming on YouTube right now. And and Bruce thinks that it's ridiculous for me to do this, but I don't know. The stream on YouTube it's ridiculous. ridiculous. It just seems like a lot of work. Oh. Well there you yeah. go. That's but, but, but if John is willing to do it. Yeah. Yeah. We're if happy to willing do it. to do it. Do it. It's not that hard. And then the, the webinars are available like immediately. I don't have to post them immediately or ever. <laughs> yeah, because then you save there. yourself the trouble and just have a link to this stream. Exactly. Cool. Well, there are two people watching right now on YouTube. Hi, YouTube. <laughs> YouTube anyway. on YouTube. <laughs> I don't remember what happened on the open webinar. I don't think. Oh, you, you, you picked up on that pretty good, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> I'm listening. I'm, try I'm trying to learn here. Mm -hmm. But Bruce Arnold was there. He did files. Arnold did J files. That's oh, what that's I right. Arnold. Yeah, yesterday. that's right. He had questions on, on J files. Yeah, well, I had questions both we both on both of them. One. And there was, was an a good question, question, question that and Greg Bailey answered. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was a good. Um, the J files question was good because I learned something again. I mean, you taught it to me once, I think, and then you taught it to me again, Bruce. Which was the the nested queues with the JSON stuff, putting the queue on the back end of the name. Yes. yes. Yeah. Nested keys. Important. It is. Um, yeah, I can't wait to give that a try. And then NetTalk, that went for an hour yesterday. Yeah, a little over an hour. Um, yeah. What do we talk 13. about? Arnold Mike was there too. Double-click behavior, now to set a bug report with the headings. We're talking about sequence, sharing a second license across programs, across the network. Yep. Uh, Don was having trouble with these themes and he's still missing themes.txt, which is very unusual. I've never seen that before, but it, we'll see what happens there. And Mike was having a problem with uploading images to the HTML editor, but it seemed to work in the example. So he's gone off to have a look at that. And again, I mean, twice in one week, Arnold had a question about using uh, cloud uh, drives um, as a automatic repository for backups and things like that. So Dropbox and OneDrive and Google Drive. That's and he so tells cool. me it's all working. Uh, it it, I, got, I got it working. So I just have to put it in my real app now. I just did it in the tester app. Yeah. Yeah. So it's quite a cool. Well, you, you, you just, you're just making automatic backups and then posting them to one of the cloud drives, yeah? Mm-hmm. It's a good use. Why not? It's a very good Why use. Why not? Word. Yeah. Oh. And I can pick it up from anywhere, you know? I, uh, I, I had an, a, an announcement. Oh, you do? Yes, it's a, <laughs> it's a change. It's a slight change. Uh -oh. As far as presenters go, in the past, We've we've scheduled two hours for the webinar, and we we seem to go two hours. However, moving forward, I don't feel the need to go two hours anymore. 
Yeah, and you're done, you're done. That, and didn't we say, thank God you finally came to? <laughs> I think I, I remember something like that, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yep. You know, you know what, I, I well, enjoyed it. You, you left town, you left town and says, John's not here. John's not here. We can stop. <laughs> yeah, and you would stop. Yep. And then, uh, Sorry, Mike. What were you saying? Well, I was just going to say, that in that case, my session will be 15 minutes today. <laughs> <laughs> That's making me a bit nervous, but that's okay. I'll get through it. I'll push through it. If it's 15 minutes, I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll get through. Yeah. yeah I could do a series of 15 minutes. I could do like six today. And you could break the like record. Your... Yes. I was going to no, say, so John's going to uh, take as much time as you need or as little time as you need to when you're done, you're done. I'm thinking Mike may go for. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Minutes. Don't tempt me. <laughs> well, okay, let's, let's say let's say this. Here's and make sure I've got the policy right here. There's a new policy in place. It can go as long as it needs to go up to two hours. All right. If it's going to go over two hours, then we want to break that into two parts. Otherwise, you can go as long as you desire or as short as you desire. But then that was a the minimum. End. So if it is if it is a twenty minute thing, then it's a twenty minute thing, right? But we would like to know that, so maybe we have two 20-minute things on a Friday. Is yeah. that what you're thinking? Sure, but if we don't, I mean, we don't. I guess I'm, we don't. I guess we don't. Right. Oh, I, I'm loving your new two. <laughs> just we a lousy fair. Yeah, pretty wow. much. I, just because, I mean, it's good, to, it's good to touch base with the Clarion community every week. I love that part, right? I love, I love talking with you guys every week and learning new things every week. But we rely on people presenting, right? And it might be a little daunting to say, oh, by the way, you have to prepare like an hour and a half presentation, you know, for this thing. What I'm saying now is you don't. You know, if you have something that, that's really cool to share and it takes you five minutes, then Clarion Live ends at, you know, 20 after the hour or something. That's, and you know what? It. That gives you more time to go listen to the recordings from CIDC from right the past. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So if you've been thinking of doing a presentation, but you're like, I can never fill that time. Don't worry about it. Don't, Don't worry. It Don't worry. All. No. Just come on. And what you do is what you do. And we're happy to have you. And come talk to us. Yeah. And, and what you'll discover is that once you start talking about that super cool thing that you love so much, you'd be amazed at how the time flies. And you want more time. And then we have to say, no, that's it. Yeah. But then we get to have you back, which is a nice thing. Yeah. yeah. So there you and, go. And, and I can't tell you how many guys that have come on nervous and all that, and they just wanted to do the next one and the next one. And it was just a pleasure to watch. So cool. I, I remember uh, I, I one of the first ones early days was uh, Joe Toyer, right? Yeah. He was, he was really, <laughs> really nervous about doing <laughs> this. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. yeah. He prepared. He did all these things, and he was like, I don't know if I can do this. And we're like, here we okay. And he came on, and then almost immediately after, he was like, I want to do another one. He was ready yeah, to go. No, it's, a, it, it's a very infectious sensation. It's very addictive. Yeah. So, anyway, there you go. So, don't there be concerned about time. If you have something you think is worth sharing or, you know, you just want to present anything, it's – it's fine. And if you're not sure, it's ask fine. us. We'll tell you yes. <laughs> we'll probably say that's right. It's an automatic yes. Can I present this? Yes. As long as it's clarion related, yes. So there you go. Okay. I think we are. Okay, Mike, are you ready? We went on. I think I'm ready, yeah. Okay. So let's For your 10-minute presentation? Oh. Yeah, yeah. For my 10-minute for my presentation. Because <laughs> we got nothing next week, so this would be a good, good time to have a three-parter. Send it over to me. Okay. Oh, while you're sending it, John, the, the rule for the open webinar on Wednesday is the same. You want to keep those at an hour, right? Yeah, yeah, uh, an hour. And then, but Bruce says that his can go as long it, as he wants. As, as long as anybody has questions. Yep. Long or short as needed. Okay. Hey, somebody so, has uh, a hand. The Thursday one, we're not. It depends on, on whether um, I've got uh, something after or not. But uh, if we, I don't mind it going a little bit long if we have more questions. Or short if we don't. That's it. We, when we're done, we're done. Here's, here's another quick policy. If, you're, if you want to speak and you want to raise your hand, type in the questions box first what you want to talk about. Otherwise, I think we're not going to just open your mic randomly. Okay. And say that you have a mic or don't because uh, it gets hard. 
right yeah we don't want to we don't want to go into silence mode okay exactly okay mike you're mike, right. looking forward Lovely. to it. Good. Well, well, and this for those of you who are at DevCon, this is going to be a a more in depth um, uh, session that extends basically beyond some of the some of the higher level concepts. So my, my session at DevCon was only thirty minutes, uh, so I was able to kind of skim over the surface. Uh, but what I want to talk about today is, is is a little bit more of an in depth look on on the whole concept of multi threading. <clears throat> how you do it, why you do it, uh, some of the things you have to be concerned about. Uh, and to some extent, I'd like this to be a, a, a two-way kind of thing. So if you have thoughts, comments, uh, questions, uh, if you think I'm an idiot and I've made a stupid mistake, I want to hear all of it. So I, I'll try to keep a, an eye on the questions box uh, in, in case anything pops up. But uh, guys, if, uh, if somebody ask the question and if I have not um, and if I've not spotted it fairly quickly uh, feel free to get my attention and we'll uh, we'll deal with it so on the topic of multi-threaded development uh, really there are uh, a number of factors you have to consider uh, first of all you have to think about why do I even want to do this and I would hope as, as software developers we kind of get the, the, the situation that users really don't want to wait. And we've got these wonderful computers with multiple processors and most of these processors have multiple threads. So our computers can do a whole lot of things at once and the user is sitting there saying, why isn't this thing happening faster? So because we have all these threads on the, on the, uh, and all these uh, cores and all of these uh, threads on the cores, it would be nice if we can make use of them more. And there are many situations where you're going to have in your application something you're doing that you could run in the background, whether that's, you know, sending off messages or waiting for, uh, waiting for a report to, to churn away in the background so that it can be ready to pop up for the user anytime they want, or, you know, running dashboards, you know, and Bruce is into, into the dashboard thing and, and I think many of us should be and dashboards you could have a bunch of different thing images up on your dashboard and each one of them could be getting updated by a completely separate thread uh, so that not that one of them doesn't end up stalling another maybe one can be updated very quickly the other one takes a lot longer uh, and each of these could be managed in the same thread so ultimately multi-threaded development we're doing it really because our users want things to happen as soon as possible and they want to make use of, of the resources that are in their machine so when we are dealing with multi-threaded development, we have really um, uh, two factors that you have to consider. We have threads. Threads, of course, are just you know individual processes. They're running all by their lonesome. They're doing their thing, uh, and they're they're working at stuff. And they could be accessing local memory. They could be accessing global memory. But the point is, you have some process which is running, and it's just doing something. Beyond that, uh, you don't even really need to think about that uh, other than you now have to say, okay, if I've got a thread doing that all by itself, what's the next thing we have to do? And the next thing we have to do is we have to have one thread talk to another thread. So we have this concept of inter-thread communications where one thread can send some kind of a message to another thread. And there are a whole bunch of ways of doing that. You can send uh, a Windows event. Uh, you can uh, set up a socket and then communicate via sockets. There's all kinds of ways you can do this. And, and we'll eventually talk about a number of different ways, but, but initially anyway, we're gonna, we're gonna cover the whole concept of using Windows messages and more specifically the special message uh, that we can use a notification, which allows you to pass along a little bit of extra information. Uh, and then finally, we have this concept of memory, because even though each of your threads is running all by its lonesome, uh, the, uh, each thread needs to access not only local memory, but it needs to access global memory occasionally, and that global memory may be threaded, meaning it has its own copy. A great example of that is uh, the file uh, buffers. All of our all of our files normally tend to be threaded, uh, so that when we're accessing a particular file, we have our own copy of the record buffer. We have our own handle into the uh, into the database uh, when it's open and closed, uh, and we don't have to worry about tromping on somebody else's. Uh, record buffer in another thread. Uh, so that works out quite well, but occasionally you will have global memory that really needs to be shared, where everybody has to touch the same stuff. 
And when you start doing that, then you have to worry about this concept of synchronization, which basically just says, uh, I have to make sure I play nice so that if I need to do something with that shared resource, I have a protocol to say, is it available? Can I have it? Okay, great. Now I've got it so nobody else can have it until I'm done. And you've got to make sure you do things like not taking you making use of that resource for too long uh, because if it's a shared resource and you have lots of threads that are running you want to make sure that you don't accidentally uh, uh, dominate things too much so that all those other threads are sitting there twiddling their thumbs because of course then you defeat the whole purpose of multi-threaded programming so much like when we're doing database transactions and you want to start a transaction and write some records and end the transaction you want that transaction to be as small as possible that's even more critical uh, when it comes to uh, doing uh, interthread uh, uh, sharing of memory. Uh, you really want to have that access to the memory as fast as you possibly can. So a lot of times you'll end up saying, I need access to that. You'll go on and get it, uh, get access. You'll grab the thing in memory you want, and you'll actually make a copy of it just so that you can release the shared memory back to uh, the main, uh, the main uh, pool so that everybody else can have their chance. So let's talk about um, a, a few of these things. Now, as far as starting a thread, uh, and I'm going to I'm going to stick for at least today. Maybe we'll go into this in more depth another day. Um, but um, but today we're going to talk about threads running within a single program. Uh, of course, you can do multi-processing by having multiple programs all running at the same time, and those programs could be talking back and forth to each other. You could have a server that's running running processes, and you ask it to do something, and then it sits there churning away doing stuff, and you can check in with it every once in a while to say hey are you done that report I asked you to do so you can do all kinds of sort of multi-processor multi-system multi-network you know processing where, where you get a lot of parallelism that way but in this particular case we're going to talk about multiple threads running on a clarion program one instance of the program and as all of you know, uh, to start a thread, you have to actually issue the start command. And the start command is, uh, is, is fairly straightforward. You just say start in the name of the procedure, something like this, start my procedure. And that's all you have to do, and you would now have a new thread. Now, there's a little bit more involved to it than that because uh, in many cases you might say, you know what, I, I need a really big stack uh, so uh, because I've got lots and lots of local variables. So occasionally you might say, you know what, I, I know that I've got a really greedy program. I want a 50 K stack instead of, I, I think the default, I believe is 25,000 bytes. Uh, it's not generally a problem anymore because so much of the time, if the local variables you want, it used to be the local variables that would always go onto the stack. Uh, but nowadays, Clarion is smart enough to say, hey, that's a really big thing you're asking for in local memory. It'll kind of look like it's in the stack as far as you're concerned, but really it's going to be on the heap, and I got lots of memory in the heap. So <clears throat> it's not as critical anymore that you uh, that you set your uh, stack size when you start. So in most cases, you'll notice this second parameter is, uh, is missing and omitted. Uh, and then you can have up to um, uh, three parameters. And you don't have to pass any if you don't want to, but up to three. And the thing to recognize is these must be string parameters. And the procedure that you're calling must not have optional parameters. So uh, you can't have a procedure that you start, and sometimes it has one, sometimes it has two, sometimes it has three. Uh, if you want to pass in parameters, it always has to pass in the number of strings that your procedure actually takes. And uh, this can be handy when you're starting up a procedure to say, I, I just need to tell you something about the context of what you're doing so you're aware of what's really going on. In, in most cases, when we're doing multi-threaded programming, we won't pass a lot of um, uh, contextual information that says, okay, here's specifically what I want you to do. It's more likely when you pass, uh, pass in a parameter, it's something like, oh, hi, I'm starting you, and oh, by the way, the thread number that started you is my thread. So you'll see something like this where it actually passes in the thread number of the calling thread. And that way, that when the uh, when the thread you're starting uh, is started, it can say, hey, I know who my parent thread is, so that when something happens and I want to tell my calling thread, I know who called me. So that's, that's a very common thing you'll see in a start uh, command where you're doing multi-threaded programming, is you'll actually pass that through in that way. Hey, Mike. Yeah. 
there's a, a question here on on your second parameter your stack size mm -hmm. right so if i if i set that am i setting a limit yes as to what it would be so it would it would, it would stop there right so, is it, it would, so it, it, you could like actually get a stack overflow error at that point theoretically right. so it's probably better than to like i mean that seemed to be the thing i that I used to do all the time is put in this 25,000. So is it best to go back and just take out all those 25,000? The 25,000 is default, so it's redundant. If you're saying 25,000, then you're basically saying nothing. Um, now, there is something interesting to notice here. In your project settings uh, for, for your project, the default stack size it generally defaults to 16. K, even though when you start a new thread, it says, so, so this is the default stack size for thread one, the very first thread that starts in the program. <clears throat> but then after that point, any other threads that pop up, it's whatever their stack size is at that time. But again, um, Clarion uh, does a lot of funny little magic in the background where if it's easier trying to allocate a uh, you know, one gig string in local data, it's just, I, I, I'm not putting that in the stack. I'm going to have a reference to that, to something on the heap, and I'll allocate it for you at runtime. Um, so you'll, you'll notice, that, and, and because in Clarion, we don't do a lot of funny stack pushing and popping and uh, uh, for that kind of stuff. It's, it's not generally an issue, but uh, I remember back when, uh, when I was running with C, uh, and put doing a lot of programming there where uh, we would actually do things like saying okay uh, this variable and I want to walk back and forth on the parameter chain based upon uh, the pointer of the particular variable that was passed in the stack and you knew that your parameters were, were pushed onto the stack first and then all your local variables came after that so you do all kinds of math to, to walk around the stack and we just don't do that in the Clarion world at least not not in any normal fashion uh, theoretically you probably could but there's not much need for it. So in general, I tell people to ignore that, although it can occasionally come up. Uh, and you'll notice you do have runtime checks up down here where you can specify, please watch for a stack overflow. So every single time you call a procedure, it's going to check to see if it's running at a stack. And you can you can blow up a, a clearing program because it, it's not smart enough to put everything in the stack. If it's a bunch of little stuff, it's going to say, hey, you know, this is a bunch of little stuff. I'll let it be on the stack. And if you have a recursive call that goes bang, 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 and you call it a million times, you will blow up the stack. Uh, there's just no doubt about it. Uh, and I'm sure we've all done it. But for the most part, you uh, you don't really need to worry too, too much about it, especially when you consider things like queues. You could have a queue in, in local data, and your queue has a little record buffer, but the the records of the queue are not stored in local data. They're actually allocated from the, from the heap. Uh, so even though you have a local queue, all that's on the stack is the uh, is the actual uh, the actual buffer itself, and I suspect that if you try to allocate a local queue, and one of the things inside the queue buffer was a massive huge string, it probably would put that on the on the heap as well. Uh, although we could start doing experiments, but we're not going to digress at the moment. But uh, but but generally speaking, you don't need to worry so much about stack space as you used to. Okay. So uh -huh. unless you're getting stack overflow errors, it's probably okay to leave it. Yeah, yeah, and if you do, you'll probably discover it's one particular procedure that just has to happens to have a really funny mix of variables. Uh, yeah, tons and tons of local variables that are all smallish, and uh, and Clarion says, hey, these are all small; they should be just fine to fit on the stack. And fortunately, you just sort of set it up to fail by using so much in local data, um, and uh, uh, and in that situation, you bump it up. I, I can only recall over the last. 20 years, maybe two or three times where I had to increase the stack size, uh, where I was running out of stack space. So, it, it, and, and as I say, that was a long time ago. I have not had to do that recently. So, uh, it, it's almost a non-issue these days. Okay, cool. Uh, Wolfgang just had a comment on your thread where you're passing the thread over. That thread returns along, but yes. it's converted It'll be passed to a as a string. Yeah, it has converted. So, yeah, so it's okay to throw longs into your strings. String. Exactly. Yeah, like I could have a map here. Uh, and I have my procedure is a procedure and it's string uh, calling thread. And that's going to work perfectly fine. And then inside of my procedure, you could, you know, you could make reference to, uh, to it directly or you could, uh, inside the procedure, you could say uh, my caller and go signed. Uh, and then when the program starts up, you can say my caller equals calling thread. But you'd really only do that if you really wanted to see it in a, in a numerical variable. 
but in most cases, the doesn't really matter if the you know, number clearing is great as far as doing these automatic conversions. So not an issue whatsoever. Seems like a, you could almost just only pass strings around. There was an uh, article where it said everything in clearing is a string anyway. So, I can't. I can't uh, Maybe my, a discussion for another day. But. I can't right now. The um yeah the um and and that's the thing I wouldn't suggest calling passing everything around as strings because that gets a little bit inefficient you know if you got long it's long why why pass it around as a string um but uh, but there are certainly situations where as a universal communications vehicle a string is a very handy thing to use and you'll see that I'm actually going to make use of it here in uh, in uh, in some of the stuff we're doing in terms of messages we're passing around I'm, I'm using a string to just store all kinds of different stuff. <clears throat> Okay. okay. So, um, just to just not to digress yeah. too far, but yeah, yeah. Wolfgang's comments: passing groups allows to pass more than three parameters, a wild mix of numerics and strings. Absolutely. Yeah. It's kind of out of scope of the presentation, but yeah, a little bit. But but that is that is that actually well, it is and it isn't because as I mentioned, I'm I'm going to discuss re, uh, later on how I use a string to pass around messages, but that string uh, could contain a group. So we could have, for example, um, the call. Let's call this calling info. Uh, and then we can have calling info, uh, or sorry, yeah, string and calling info group. And it could be a group type, and we could have a calling thread is assigned, and then other stuff, string, 10, whatever. Okay. Um, and then you, my procedure is like that, and then it's now got this calling info coming in instead. And we're going to say uh, in our main program, we're going to have uh, calling info uh, procedure, or sorry, uh, like calling info group uh, and a period. Or sorry, I actually don't need the period. Um, there's two ways of doing that when you're, it, 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 clearing is a little odd that way. If I had a class defined with a type, then I could just use my class name. But with a group, you must say like the group. There's no option. It would be nice if I could just say like that, but it doesn't work. Uh, so you can say like that. The other way you can do it is you can also do it like this here. You can say group and then end. Same thing. Um, but anyway, so you can say like uh, info calling group and then I could say calling info and we're assuming this is a local uh, variable in this little procedure where this is going to call it. So you say calling info dot um, calling thread equals uh, thread uh, calling info dot other stuff equals other stuff equals blarg there. And then when I start this thing, I could then pass in the calling info. And because the calling info is a group and a group is a string, it says that's fine, no problem. So now we get the string called, called in with the calling info. And then uh, what I would do is I would then have another copy of it like this, uh, calling info, and maybe put an underscore or something just to make it separate from this thing. Or we could make put a P there if we wanted and then just have this one like that. And then the first thing I do is I say, and when I come to our procedure, calling info equals P calling info. And I've now essentially cast the string into the group, uh, which because we're passing in the exact same kind of structure when we first call it, uh, when we pass it in here, this calling info and the calling info coming in. Now I can make a copy and now I can access uh, my actual variables. I could say my uh, caller equals calling info uh, calling thread. Same kind of thing. So yes, yeah, certainly. Oh, we don't want it to restart. Go away. So there's that uh, that concept, and that that will certainly come into play when you're trying to pass information around in your messages. Yeah, so let's nix all of this stuff here. Now, next up, uh, so starting a thread. So, of course, once we start a thread, we need to pass around uh, variables, or sorry, pass around messages. And and we could do all of this manually if we wanted to. So when you want to pass in a message, there's really two ways you could easily do it uh, within Clarion. You could say post, event, user, and then you'll notice that uh, here it thinks I'm done. I just wanted to show me some code here. Um, program. 
uh, here. Maybe I just wanted to see the uh, the extension stuff here. Okay, I had to trick it into thinking I was actually in a program, so it would show me the uh, the code completion. Um, so in this case, I'm passing through an event. Uh, you could pass it to a particular equate, but in this case, because we're passing it between threads, that second parameter is going to be omitted because we're not sending it to a particular field on a screen. We're sending it to that thread over there, which means you have to say, I want to send it to that thread, oh, that thread. And then finally, there is this parameter that says, do you want this thread to, to be, to basically to bump everybody else in the queue? Is this thread so, is, is this message so important when you're sending it to this other thread that you want this message to jump to the front of the line so that the very next message that this other thread tries to get uh, will be this message because, for example, you need it to immediately close down, uh, for example. Uh, so the, um, uh, in most cases, you don't want to pass that, but in the situation where you do, you'll know that you do and you'll simply make sure that you pass through that uh, the, and just set that extra parameter to true. To, uh, to force it to the front of the line. Simon says, the key point is that started procedures can only have string parameters, but Clarion looks after you. Yes, exactly. Thank you, Simon. So, uh, so you'll notice this, there's this event user. We have lots of different events, event open window, event accepted, event this, event that. Event user, it represents the first event number. And if we highlight the cursor over it, you'll see that it has a number. It's 400 hex. Now, if we take a look at, uh, is it equates.clw? Yep. Uh, you'll see event user is down here, and then uh, is a 400 hex. If you look at all these other events, you'll discover that none of them are 400 hex. Uh, so what you can do is that means that this whole bank of events is completely and thoroughly open to you for your personal pleasure. Now, what you should do is if you actually do want to pass through events and start things like that, uh, you should set up uh, some equates. And you'll want to uh, be aware of the fact that you're not the only person who's going to be arbitrarily choosing an event, uh, an event user, and sending it through. So try and pick just some weird number. Fortunately, we have a very large range of them where we're allowed to, uh, to go through and, uh, and process events. Uh, I think because it's a signed value, you can go from 400 hex, uh, which is, uh, I'm not sure what that is, what, 10,000 or something? Uh, or sorry, 1,000. Yeah, that's a thousand. Um, so it's from a thousand all the way up to whatever number you can store and assign, uh, which is probably two billion or something like that, a very large number. So you can really just pick anything at random and then start numbering. If you're going to use a series of these events, just start numbering from that point. So uh, so if we took a look, for example, at, uh, I probably have one in here, um, CT event. Oh. Uh, Do I have one? Yes, I do. User events. So in this case, it's the user event plus 333. I just pick some numbers. Sometimes I'll just go crazy just to put a whole bunch of numbers there. And so there, probably nobody's going to use that number. Uh, and then I'll have my series of events and I'll use an itemized equate so that they all end up being unique. And as long as your program is always being recompiled and seeing the latest version of your EQU file, you can just keep adding more things to the bottom. And if you don't like the order you're seeing them in, just go ahead and rearrange them to your heart's content because every single time you recompile your program, everybody just picks up on, oh, I'm using that new number now. Uh, so everything will always work fine. So definitely uh, uh, be careful of how you use your use your user events and uh, and but there's as long as you're just marginally careful, like I say, just picking some number at random, you're probably going to be okay. What you should not do is just use event user directly, unless this is a very small program and you know that there's nobody else ever going to use that. There's no third-party tools. There's no nothing else involved. So for doing demonstration programs, I might use event user, but uh, but I'm not going to use it other than that. <coughs> Excuse me. Mm. Now, next up, but, but to tell you the truth, the problem with passing around an event is all it says is <coughs> essentially, hey, and if that means something, if you just, you know, shout blue, then 
if blue means something to the other to the other thread that you're passing this event to, then that's great. But in a lot of cases, it's not enough just to say, "Hey, blue," and the person understands. Oh, I was told blue. Great. Um, in many cases, if not most, you want to have more information involved. You need to not only be notified that something has happened, but you want to have some corresponding data that comes through, uh, some context of well, why, are, why in the world are you even trying to get my attention here? What do you need me to do? Um, additionally, if you post an event like this, when the, uh, the thread that you post it to gets that, they get the event, but they have no clue who even told them. To, to fire that particular event. It doesn't know the difference in that and something the user might be doing. Uh, so the, the, the concept of using event to do to, to, to inter-thread communication is quite limited. Um, and I, I commented that you want to notify them of this because it really is a command called notify. And when you use notify, it's uh, it's somewhat similar in that you've got a uh, you've got a number of parameters here. But when you post and notify, it's kind of like if we could pass through uh, some additional information to the uh, to the post command. If we could say post event user, and then we can have info group that we pass through or uh, other data like that. It, it's kind of like that. Um, and if we come to the notify here, you'll notice that we can pass through a code. And think of this code almost like uh, the next step beyond a, uh, an event uh, where uh, the notify, notify codes you specify are completely arbitrary. Uh, when you do notify another thread, it gets that notification initially as just another event. Uh, it, what it specifically sees is it says, hey, I just got an event. It's event notify. Cool. And it's now gotten the heads up that, hey, somebody just sent me a notification event. And it can then say, please tell me everything about that notification. Uh, and then it proceeds onwards from there. So the kind of stuff that you can tell that other thread when it, when it gets the event notify and it comes back and says, tell me all about it. There's really just these one two things you can pass. You can pass through the notification code, which is, as I say, just an arbitrary number that you're saying, hey, this is a particular kind of notification. I want you to be able to recognize that this notification is being different from another notification, much like you can have different user events, uh, and each of them means something different. So the notification code is, think of that as the type of thing that, you, that, that you're passing through, although really it's anything you want. You know, if you want it to be the number of seconds uh, you know, uh, that it's supposed to wait for something, as long as you're parent and you're as long as the caller and the receiver understand what that code means it can really be anything you want but usually I think of it as a task or a kind of operation that you want it to perform um, the thread is the thread you want to send the notification to uh, you can actually use notification to notify yourself if you wanted to so the default for the thread number is zero much like the default for the thread number for posting is also zero uh, and then finally uh, you have one additional parameter and that parameter defaults to zero but this is where you can start having more information about uh, what you wanted to do. So uh, what we're going to be doing a, a little a later here is using notification to is tell a thread there's a message you need to pick up. So my notification code essentially is, hey, there's a new message. And it sees the notification code and goes, oh, great. What's the message number? And it looks in the parameter. It looks in this third, uh, this third uh, thing being passed through to say, what's the message number? So it gets really three bits of information ultimately coming through. It gets the concept of, actually, really four, and I'll show you the fourth one in a second. It gets the concept of, um, I just got a notification message, event notification. That's the first piece. I now have to pick up the information. I'm going to get a code, which generally indicates the kind of thing I'm supposed to do. Uh, I will get the thread number of the person who sent me the message, which might be significant because you could have a single child, a single worker thread responding to many parents. Uh, let's say it was doing something like uh, uh, sending out a, a Twilio 
texts. So you wanted to have this, this thread in the background and its own, own job was just to sit there and any time a Twilio text needed to be sent out, it would do it. So it would simply sit there and it would say, I'm just sitting here waiting for a, hey, there's a notification. Oh, good, I'm supposed to send out another text? Great, I'll send it out. And it's all happening in the background, completely separate from your, your main foreground thread. Um, so you would send through notify, so it might be say some code, um, that thread, uh, some parm. And then on the other side is going to end up seeing that event equals event. And on the other side when it's picked up you'd end up some, so seeing something like if event equals event notify, and then you'd say notification, and this is how you pick up the notification. You'll notice the notification has three parameters and they're all reference parameters. They all have stars in front. So you can pick up the code and that is the only absolutely required thing. This is the thread that sent you the message and then this is the optional parameter. And of course, uh, if you don't care who's asking you to do it, you don't have to pick up those things, uh, but uh, it's quite handy to be able to make use of them. You'll notice that they are unsigned, signed, and long. Not sure why there's such an odd mix of, of variables, but um, you end up having to have unsigned, signed, or here, let's go code, uh, uh, notify code, notify uh, thread and, and notify parameter. Signed and long. And notify code is probably, is that I say unsigned really? Notification, yeah, unsigned. Um, so this is going to be from zero to a very large number. I guess they felt it wasn't necessary to have negative numbers. Uh, the notify thread uh, is because the thread is assigned because the throops, sorry. The thread uh, function returns assigned. So that's why your notify thread is signed. Uh, and then, and if you'd look deeper into Windows, you'd probably discover that Windows uses a signed for its threads. And then finally, when it's passing around this message, the notify parameter really is being handled by Windows own uh, event handling. And with Windows messages or Windows events, we call them events in Clarion, but in, in, uh, in Windows they're called messages. Those messages always have these optional parameters. Uh, so it's just basically saying, I'm going to do a Windows message where I'm actually going to carry the stuff along and pass it into you. And that parameter of extra information in the Windows message happens to be along. So there is a reason each of these things are, are slightly different, but I always have to look up which types that I want to use whenever I want to use notification. So you see notification and then you end up getting the notify code, notify thread, and the notify parameter. And after you call that, you will now have those three values sitting in those local variables and you can do whatever you need to do with them. So that's the basic the basic concept of you. You send the notification over with some information uh, and then the other event or the other thread gets the notify event and then it has to call notification to actually pick up that information from the other side. So you can, as I say, do all of this yourself. And, uh, and it'll work perfectly fine, but it's, it's a lot of work. It's a little, uh, a little involved and, and it's quite limited in the kind of stuff you can do back and forth. Uh, it doesn't have a lot of coordination involved. And there are many of these things that you're doing that uh, are just drudgery. You know, the, the, there's a lot of extra effort you have to go through to handle multi-threaded uh, programming. Um, one definite limitation you might have right here is, let's say you wanted to send a message. Well, where are you going to send the message? Are you going to use a, a queue? Are you going to use a, a local, uh, uh, are you going to use a non-threaded global data? Are you going to put them in a database? They're, they're always different factors. And you've got to think about those and kind of solve those problems. So uh, what I did is I threw together a little facility to uh, to manage the whole concept of uh, threads, doing work and, and uh, communicating back and forth. And the uh, objects or the classes just happen to be up here. We have a message class, which we'll look at in a second. And the, the job of the message class is quite simply, <coughs> excuse me, 
uh, just to be a message. Uh, it's just some information you want to pass over. And we'll take a look at that in a second. Uh, the hub is the central um, uh, handler of all these things. Uh, it's basically the thing that you call to ask uh, to send a message, uh, to, uh, to notify somebody that a worker is starting up. Um, all of the coordination is done in the hub. There is also a message handler, and the message handler is a base class uh, for uh, threads to use to say, I need to, I, I'm going to be a thread that doesn't work and I'm going to handle messages. And you could just derive that directly if you want to. But then I decided to extend the message handler to two broad concepts. You can have a worker thread, and its job is generally to do work, uh, and it will be sent messages to, to, to be told what it is supposed to do and such things. Uh, and then there will also be a manager uh, class, and the manager class is somebody who wants to get stuff done, uh, who wants to, to, to ask the workers to actually perform a task. Uh, so uh, both of these uh, classes are derived from the message handler because they both have to handle messages. They send messages, they ret retrieve messages and such things. But there's, there's enough variation between what a worker does and a manager does that I felt it was worthwhile uh, extending those classes. So let's jump in and, and look a little bit at, uh, at what some of these classes are doing here. So we'll go ahead and open up this one. So here is the... Um, because we have messages, messages can go through a certain life cycle. Uh, and this first itemized uh, status uh, section here handles that. So a message, when you first send it, is pending, meaning I've sent the message out to, to, to whoever I want to receive it, uh, but it's not been picked up yet, so it's pending. So that's the first status, and you notice I just happened to default that to zero. There's really nothing special, you've just created it, and you're waiting. Uh, when the message is uh, sent, um, it means the message was actually received by somebody. And there's, a sl there's actually two parallel paths because there are two kinds of uh, ways of handling a message that I, that I thought would be useful. In some cases, you're sending a message to say, hey, could you go do this? And the response is, you know, they pick up the message and that's it. The message is done, it's sent, it's finished, it's, it's completed. Um, in other cases, um, uh, you might want to have it change to a status of, uh, of um, I am, uh, okay, i am started working on that stuff for you, but I'm not done yet. So as soon as I am done, I'm going to uh, tell you f th that I'm finished the job. So while I am working at it, the status of that message, it, it holds on to it and says, okay, this is something that we're actually doing right now. And then once the, uh, the process is actually completed, then it changes the status of the message to say, okay, I'm now done this thing so that it can then respond back to the, the manager to say, okay, I finished that thing you asked me to do because you cared to find out when I was actually done. Uh, and then there's a, a final special status uh, where you've sent a message, but for some reason the, uh, the thread that you've told it to go to is no longer in existence in a way that's useful. Uh, so that message essentially just goes off in a never never land. It's it's there marked undeliverable. And and theoretically it stays there forever, which is kind of a good thing because um, it you want to be if you suddenly realize you're getting lost messages, you'd like to have some ideas to what kinds of messages are just going missing. Uh, so uh, once you suddenly go, oh my world is blowing up. Um, uh, let's go and start inspecting the queue and look at what kind of messages are sitting there. Oh, look at all these undeliverable messages. Oh, I know what's going on. So it's handy having those things as, uh, as basically uh, uh, breadcrumbs, so to speak. It looks like Simon's uh, posted on the message. Stepped away, Mike is moving on to the magic of notify and the fact that it can pass that magical last parameter, lots of scope there. Mike probably sucking eggs, but you know notifies are LIFO, last in, first out. Uh, are they? Oh, really? Okay. I, 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 actually, uh, I actually did not know that, but I don't think it's, really, notifications are last in, first out. That's remarkable. Well, or, oh, yeah, 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 of course, yeah. No, uh, absolutely. Okay, I know what you're getting at now. I was going to say because when you do notification messages, it just sets them up in the message queue, so those messages just go through. But the in, in terms of the notification, oh, I see what you're saying is if you do uh, two notifications 
Well, I wonder about that. Okay, Simon, do you have a mic? I'm curious. I just want to get clarity on, on what you're I can, saying here. I can tell you. I've okay, you tell me. With this. Yes, yes, yeah. you tell me, John. If you send notify one and then notify two right afterwards, yeah. notify two gets processed first. And then ah, one. interesting. Very cool. Yeah, it always jumps to the front of the of the line, whichever you sent. That's a hassle. Yeah. <laughs> now, does that mean, whoa, okay. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Are you saying this is like, um, like an HP calculator, like Polish, uh, reverse Polish notation. Okay. Yeah. Now, and, and I've not actually run into this as a problem. Uh, and, and ultimately it's probably not a huge cue. The key thing is we want to make sure that if you use notify and then use notification to pick it up, like, okay. And I guess here's what I'm wondering is if you do a notify, well, I guess it wouldn't really matter. Would it? Uh, as long as the message gets processed, but if it gets processed out of order, that could be a, a, a potential issue. So we might have to write some code to handle that that situation. Or uh, or did you code around it, John, when you discovered that, or did you just say, "Hey, that's okay. I don't care." I just said, "Hmm, that's interesting," and that's it. And I moved on. Okay. <laughs> I, didn't, so, I didn't really do so anything about it, but and, yeah. and that is intriguing because in situations where you need things to happen in a particular order that could potentially be an issue. Um, I, I'm not desperately concerned about it at the moment, but I do think we should perhaps address it at some stage here. Um, but the way I envision this, this is a very asynchronous thing. So it doesn't matter terribly if the uh, if a given message uh, is uh, is processed out of or processed out of order, because that's more, hey, you're a worker, you can do something generic, please go do this thing. So, uh, so I think it's probably going to be okay, but at the same time, it does concern me a little bit. And perhaps what we could do is, is uh, we could act, and the nice thing is because we've got a class doing it, I am doing it with notify, but I could theoretically do it with, um, uh, it's all based in the class. So I could completely replace that inside the class and replace the notification with a normal user event where I, um, uh, where I set it up so there's a certain hash or something coming in uh, so that I can recognize when that event comes in that it's supposed to be a particular message. Uh, I could have like a series of events, uh, user events, and I just sort of say which one have I used as sort of current happening, and uh, and as those events get picked up, I could drop them off, and then that way I could always make sure the events are handled in the right order. So, uh, but curious. That's that's uh, that's very good to know, uh, and 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 we will potentially look at refactoring our stuff to handle that if uh, if we get time and feel so inclined. All right. So uh, those are the different statuses. Uh, a message itself uh, will have a message ID. Uh, it will know who sent it. It will know who's supposed to receive it. It'll have the status of the message at this point in time. And then it's got this switch in it that says, um, uh, do you need me to report back? When you pick up the message, do you want the worker to report back that it's finished? Uh, because you maybe just you just want to huck it over the fence and say go deal with this, um, go start the report running again. I don't care. If, I don't care when it's done. I just want to get an updated version of the report sitting there on disk. So just go run yourself again. Um, or it could be something where okay, I really need to know when you're finished this. So please let me know. Uh, so it, when you uh, send the message, you can specify whether or not you want to get that notification back that it's actually completed. Um, and then defer others until done uh, is basically saying uh, when you do this task, I want to make sure that no other messages can be processed until you're done this one. Uh, in which case the system is smart enough to not even deliver. The hub is responsible for saying, oh, okay, well in that case, uh, I'm still waiting on this other guy to get done and I'm not going to, uh, I'm not going to send any more messages to the worker until they're done that one. So. The, that kind of we're you know referring back to the notification being LIFO. Um, this could actually be used already to to manage that to some extent, um, except it would be just an extension to say defer it until some until a message has been picked up. So until you until you actually get that message received, that's that's the issue. Um, Constructing the struct is to, to tidy things up. 
Um, copy to, this is a, a method that was used where when somebody sends you a message, you can, you can take a copy of the message. So you basically say, I'm going to create another message object. Uh, yeah, yeah, give me the message. I'm going to save and hold on to it because uh, the, the context of when that call came in may not be there forever. So you might need to hold on to a copy of the message. Um, and then get data and set data. You'll notice that there is a message where is it? there's a message code which is a, just a, an unsigned variable um, and you can use it to, uh, uh, to to mean whatever you want I'm saying a whole bunch of debugging statements in here because uh, uh, when you are doing multi-threaded programming uh, it's very tricky uh, and you'll find that you want to see what's happening while it's happening. So the best way to do that is debug statements. So uh, this, I, I was working on a funny little bug during DevCon uh, and uh, it, it, I came to the point where I just started peppering everything with message statements, with, with debug statements, just so that I could see exactly what was happening when. Uh, so the, uh, the constructor, all it really does is it just says, hey, this is gonna be a pending message. That's all it cares about at this point. Uh, when it destructs it, it says, if I've got any data, just dispose of it. Uh, and this is something that, you know, some people would say, well, hold on, that's dangerous. You should, you should do it like this. You say, if not, uh, self.data ampersand equals null. And sure, we could code it that way as well. But the dispose command is, is nice enough that it, basically says, okay, if this thing has a value, I will dispose of it and then clear it. If it doesn't have a value, I'm not going to do anything. So the dispose command is, is quite safe and, and I never I never bother having that extra null check because I know it's redundant. Um, I don't know how long it would take uh, to process, but as I say, it's just not an issue. Uh, now the copy to uh, just goes through and it just says I'm just going to copy through from self to target all the values of the different fields. Uh, you'll notice that the code can be assigned but the data needs to be set because there's this set data and get data concept because we're dealing with the string. So when we get the data I say do we even have data? If we don't have data then I'm just going to return an empty string. If we have data then I'm going to return it instead. So, uh, so the getting data is is does have to be smart enough as far as checking to see whether or not uh, the message, uh, whether the message the messages data packet does have a valid uh, reference variable. Uh, and then when I'm setting the data, uh, the first thing I do is I say if my data is not null, then I set it and I dispose it, and I was being neurotic here. I said, you know what, I, I want to not only dispose it, I want to absolutely make sure that it's been disposed, I want to absolutely make sure that the variable is set to null. And I could have tested that again to make sure, but I thought, oh, I just don't feel like testing it right now. But in this case, I wanted to be absolutely certain, and I was probably chasing my, my silly ghost bug at that point. I thought, well, maybe it's blowing up here. It turned out to be not that at all. Um, uh, but I won't get into the details of that right now. Um, and then what I do is I say, if the, the message, is, they're saying set the data to something, so there's a string coming in, so I'm saying if there actually is something you're passing in to me, then let's go ahead and, uh, and allocate a new string variable, the length of that, um, and then uh, just assign the value. Otherwise, it's just going to leave it as null, which is fine because it's smart enough to say, hey, uh, if it's null, then I'm going to return nothing. Um, and, uh, Simon yeah. has another simple yeah. Simon statement. Okay. Was just po uh, pointing out that some kind of critical handshake between threads is based on notify, then it can go fast, south fast. Uh, yes, absolutely, uh, yeah, Simon. And this is, as I say, because of that, why is it annoying me here again? Let's get rid of this. Well, that's um, yours. I was trying to click on that. <laughs> yeah, sorry. No, that's that's. Uh, I don't know why it bothered telling me twice, but uh, but I've already said yes, yes. I know you want to reboot. I've got it. Um, so, um, but I expect that we will uh, adjust how we're handling our notification at some point uh, to make sure that it is uh, first in, first out, instead of last in, first out. Uh, da, 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 da. The other thing I was going to say is, I'm theoretically I'm counting the length of the thing and saying is it greater than zero, but because this is a string, uh, well, I was going to say I was just going to say I just changed it to if s. But the problem is you might be passing in a bunch of spaces. A bunch of spaces are still potentially data, so I really do need to check the uh, the uh, the length 
of, of s uh, and go from there. Now I could, if I wanted to, check the size of s. I don't know if that's any faster than length. Um, the size thing is kind of curious because I could say uh, uh, a string 100 b uh, string size of a and that makes sure that b is also 100. Um, the curious thing is that s is passed in at runtime. So you'd say, oh, well, size works great when it's predefined variables that are known at compile time, but Clarion is kind enough to say, if you're passing in a variable that is a parameter and I don't know the size at runtime, I'll still let you use the word size, but I will determine at runtime what the size really is. It probably does a length call. I don't know. Uh, but maybe it's got some extra variable that says, no, I know how big the, the memory of that is for sure, and maybe that's faster than counting the characters. But um, uh, we, I, I do know that that would be perfectly fine to do that. So, uh, so we'll do that, get rid of this. But that is an interesting quirk, because normally size cannot be used for things that are, uh, are adjusted at runtime, uh, except in the case of passing parameters. It's kind of neat. All right, so that is the, the extent of our message. Very, very simple. It's just a nugget of information with some metadata on it. Okay, and we have uh, length clip s. No, God, no. Uh, so Wolfgang says, uh, should we be using length clip s instead? Uh, and the answer is absolutely positively not. Because let's say I was, uh, I had a group, and that group was a whole bunch of strings, and those strings were all blank, and that was meaningful and I wanted to pass that through as an actual meaningful group. It's a whole group that just a whole bunch of strings in it. Is If I started doing length of string of this, then it would say, oh, that thing you just sent me was a big blank string, even though it was a group with a whole bunch of fields in it that happened to be blank. Uh, th there's a big difference between null and blank. Uh, so you definitely want to just check if there's anything in that size. Not You definitely do not want to clip it. Uh, you want to take verbatim whatever it is being sent in. Okay, so there's that. Now, let us go back to, we can close that off, close that off. Let's go take a look at our, uh, I'm not going to look at the hub immediately. Let's take a look at the message handler next, because that way you get a sense as to how these messages are going to be used. Well, actually, let's look at, we'll look at the, the, um, the, the header file for the hub, because it, it's useful, because it, it helps us to know how we're going to be uh, coordinating things. Um, handlers. Remember, we have a message handler, which is just a thread that can handle messages um, and, uh, and uh, be the whole thread concept. So when that thread first comes into existence and its, uh, and its little object is there that helps it to, to talk to the hub, uh, it says, hey hub, I'm here now. So that's why ant handler does that. Uh, fetch handler is just a, a utility function inside of it because it often has to fetch the handler record from a queue. Uh, fetch message, similar thing. It has a because it has one queue of handlers, so it has a whole list of here all the people that are doing work for me right now, and it also has a queue of messages. So when it wants to fetch a particular message by ID, it can do that. Uh, it can check to see whether a given handler is active. Uh, I had envisioned, I don't think I fully fleshed it out yet, envisioned the concept that a worker could be uh, doing some work and then for some reason he can't do any work for a while. So he could say, you know what, hey, I, I'm inactive. And, uh, and we wanted to be able to handle that. Uh, so you could say, is a, is a particular handle, handler capable of taking messages right now? Because maybe the uh, maybe you have a manager thread, and he started you know ten worker threads, and each of those workers um, is is uh, potentially doing a job. So he just wants to zip, zip through all of his workers and say, I just need to find one that's not busy because I need to give him a job. Uh, so that uh, that's when he's saying, is a given handler busy or not? Uh, is message doing? Uh, recall that I said in some situations you want to get a confirmation back that, uh, that the, the message had been processed and the task requested had been completed. Um, so this, this basically just says, please go look up this message ID and check its status and see if it's being processed right now. Manage workers, or managers workers. Um, this uh, goes on and it says, how many 
worker threads does this manager have? I return that as a count. Uh, so, uh, so if a particular manager had a bunch of workers, you don't want necessarily to close off the manager uh, until the workers are also closed. Or if the manager has workers, maybe we want to make sure the workers get closed off. So that's just a, another little helper function for that. Messages just, just says how many messages are in the message queue right now. Uh, they could be in any status, but this just says how many are sitting in the queue. Uh, this says note that a manager has closed um, and this is beneficial because if a manager has a bunch of workers and you close the manager the hub has to be smart enough to say hey worker your manager is closed you better go away now uh, again I mentioned that uh, that a worker could be owned by a particular manager or they just could be a generic worker and could have any number of managers talking to them. So this would only apply in the situation where a, uh, a worker uh, was uh, spawned as being owned by a particular manager. Uh, note that a message handler is closed. Uh, in this situation, it goes through and it just some, does some tidying on the, on the message queue to, to say, okay, if this thread is closed, I have to make sure I go through the message thread and or the message queue and tidies things up. I don't necessarily delete the messages, but at the very least, I need to take the thread number off of those because if another thread starts up that's not the same thing, I don't want them to accidentally be getting the wrong messages uh, coming in. So, so it goes through and it just clears all those out. And again, if you notice your program blowing up, and you go, well, that's odd. And then you check the status of the message queue and you go, oh, look at all these uh, messages that were sent and they've got all the event, uh, all the, uh, the uh, thread numbers cleared. I guess the uh, uh, I guess this uh, manager must have closed off before tidying things properly. So again, it's just a, more breadcrumbs to help you debug things when they go south because they will occasionally when you're doing multi-threaded development. Uh, notify receiver. Uh, its job is just to say, uh, "Hey, um, uh, you're a message handler. Some there's a message for you," uh, and it actually passes through a message object. Uh, to say, hey, here's a message for you. I just wanted to give it to you. Um, receive message. Uh, the responsibility for that is, uh, is once you notify the receiver that a message is coming through, uh, then the receiver can say, I want to I want to pick up that message. So it's able to get it in a couple of different ways. I, I can't recall right off the top of my head um, the, the, there's a definitely a difference between these two things because you'll notice that both of them are passing through uh, message objects. Um, but in this one, it's saying, I want to pick up message ID such and such uh, and put it in here. Uh, the um, reset test is being used when I was writing my unit tests. Uh, of course, you can send a message. You can say, who do you want to receive the message? Here's my message uh, object. And do I need a confirmation when it's completed? Do I need a done signal? Um, we have another method here that says I need to set a particular worker as idle uh, so that you don't accidentally give him stuff to do so that I know not to notify him with messages and such. And then th when the worker is completed processing a particular message, he can tell the hub, hey, could, I just wanted to let you know I'm finished this thing now. And then the hub is responsible for saying, great, thanks for letting me know. I will now tell your manager that it's finished. You don't, uh, you don't actually have the, uh, the, the uh, workers and... Uh, and they kill that. Uh, you don't actually have the workers talking directly to the managers and vice versa. They actually have all their communications going through a hub, which is what, which gives us a great deal of flexibility as far as uh, as far as how to manage that. Uh, okay, just says, did you want a short webinar for 60 minutes? Um, I probably will be ending before too long. I, th I think probably what we'll do is we'll, we'll finish a bit more of the overview of these classes, uh, and then we'll see how far we want to dive in. We'll maybe have do a really quick look at uh, the unit tests that were written to, to handle it. Um, but yes, yeah, so it would be nice if we finished a little bit earlier because my day is rather crazy today. So let's take a look at... Uh, da, 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 the message handler. So this is it could be a worker, it could be a manager. Both of those derive from this particular class. Um, each of those will have a thread, and I, I did decide to keep 
uh, the, the thread here within this structure, although I don't think ultimately it was really necessary because everybody always knows who their own thread is. They could just call the thread function to find out who am I. So I, I put this in more because I thought perhaps I would be scanning around in structures and objects and, and just want to know um, what thread something was. But because this is always instantiated on the thread of the handler itself, this value will always be the exact same value as the value returned from the, uh, the, uh, the thread function. Uh, currently always equals thread. There, add a little note. Uh, there's a destruct method. There is no construct method because there's nothing that needed to be initialized at uh, its uh, startup. Uh, close is, is the command that's used to say um, I want to close myself. I think all it does is post an event close window, uh, but I thought it was helpful to, uh, to abstract that as a concept. Um, I want to handle a message. Um, I want to handle when a message is done. Uh, now the interesting thing here is the hub is uh, when it sends through the notification to the uh, to the, the system to to grab the message, uh, it automatically uh, does all of that within its own little take event loop. And when it sees that a message has come in, it says, "Oh, I'm going to now call." my handle message method because I just got a message via notification uh, and then when you derive this thing your actual real worker or manager can derive this particular method which is virtual to say when my base class is taking these events and it notices that I've received a message it's going to call the handle message method and I've got one of those things that can do the stuff I need to do explicitly. Uh, handle message done. Uh, similarly, uh, somebody just told me that a message was completed uh, and the worker finished. Uh, I want to get notification of that, which is slightly different than a normal message. A normal message is, I want you to do some work. Handle message done is, okay, the work that you requested is now completed. Uh, and I thought it was helpful to, to separate those as concepts. Uh, note that it's running is, uh, as you'll notice, that um, uh, when a thread first comes into being, uh, it is not necessarily immediately ready to do something. It may not have opened its window structure yet. It can't receive threads yet, nothing. So uh, the, the task of this is for it to come in and say, okay, yeah, I know that you realize that a certain worker was going to start up, but that worker isn't quite ready yet, and, and there it is. He just noted that it was running, and now we know we can officially send messages to them. Um, and the, the hub is actually smart enough to say, okay, I've been getting, I know that worker's starting up, I'm getting messages already, I'm not going to send any yet until I get, uh, until I get notification that they're actually running. Um, and then at that point, it can start sending them through. Uh, you can, of course, uh, send a message, uh, and this, I believe, is just a wrapper. Uh, it just turns around and calls the hub um, uh, so that you don't have to worry about the hub directly. The message handler worries about the hub for you. Uh, and signal message done uh, is, of course, what happens when you are finished doing whatever work you've been asked to do, and you're now telling the, uh, uh, the, uh, the hub, hey, I'm, I'm finished my job. Can you tell my manager that I'm done? Uh, and then take event is where it actually has a little message loop and I think a window structure and everything. And its job here is just to say, uh, oh, actually, you know what? I don't think it has its own message loop or it doesn't have its own accept loop. I think it might depend upon the, uh, the parent. Although it might be optional, we'll, we'll take a look in a second here. Uh, I know I, I flip-flopped on how I wanted to handle that when I wrote this up, so it may be different than I remember it at this point. So, so that's the basic message handler, uh, and let's take a quick look at how workers and threads uh, are different depending upon uh, how they think of the world. Um, you'll notice that a worker potentially cares who their manager is. Uh, when they go out of scope, uh, they need to be destructed and cleaned up. Here is the note running because a worker notes it the way it's running a little bit differently than the way a manager notes it's running. Um, run is is what uh, happens if I recall correctly when the uh, when the worker is initially run and uh, and it does a little bit of uh, maintenance of that. We can take a look at that in a second. And set busy and set idle just says okay I'm busy doing something or I'm idle. And set busy is just a call to set idle with a certain parameter. Uh, I, I often will times to do this. I could have just had set idle and said, okay, the parameter is going to say you are idle or you are not idle. 
but I like the idea of having a set busy. If I just call set busy, they say, hey, I'm busy, which means I'm not idle. Or if I'm idle and don't pass a parameter, then obviously I'm idle. So, the, so I default to true uh, when that's not passed through. So let's take a look at the actual uh, function itself here. So when it does a destruct, all I wanted to do is just trap the fact that it was destructing. I don't actually do any cleanup at this point. Um, when I am noting that I'm running, uh, I go ahead and I, uh, I call the base class method to say I am now running and then I say if I actually have a manager thread because yeah, a worker as I say could be a worker for multiple managers so if I have a manager thread uh, I want to now uh, say I am now a handler of that manager. Uh, and I believe the base class for this one actually just uh, it just adds itself as a handler, but without the manager thread option. Uh, so this actually will create the original record inside the hub. And then this one will say, oh, by the way, that particular worker is really for this manager. So it ends up doing an update of that particular hub uh, thread record there. Uh, and then uh, da, 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 this is run. Ah, okay. This is really where it. it, uh, it um, I was just commenting earlier. I wasn't sure if there was a window uh, or not. There's two ways that you could have a worker. Uh, you could have a worker which has its own window, uh, and because it has its own window, it will capture events. And you could call within that worker's own uh, event. Um, except loop, uh, you could call the take event for the worker within there uh, and it'll handle it appropriately. But you could have a worker where I don't feel like creating a window for it. I want to have a windowless, windowless worker. It's just going to, it's going to do stuff whenever it's asked to do a message. So all I'm going to do is instantiate this thing and say, now I'm going to run myself. And then within the run, it actually opens up its own little window here. It's got a toolbox attribute, so it doesn't change uh, the focus highlight of any windows and the captions. It opens up the window and it just goes ahead and starts watching for messages and it calls take event over and over and over again until eventually it just drops out and closes itself. So you can have a, a worker without needing to, to have the whole window uh, hidden so that you can handle that. But as I say, you may have a worker that really does have a window and you want to see that window. It could be a, a little dashboard toolbox up in the corner. Uh, there's a lot of ways of handling that. And set busy and set idle is, is there like that. Uh, I want to take a quick look at uh, da, 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 the, just because I think it's helpful here. We want to take a look at the, the take event here. So this is where it's taking event. It doesn't matter. It doesn't care whether it's called from that run method we just looked at or whether it's called from the worker's own window loop. Makes no difference. Um, and he just cares about a couple different things. If the window is just opened, he knows that, hey, I can start processing messages now. So I'm going to note that I'm running at this point in time. Um, if I get event notifi notified, then I'm going to take that notification. And then here's where, remember these variables? Notify code, notify thread, notify parameter, they're there. And then I'm also going to have a message that I'm going to, uh, that I'm going to capture. So I'm going to grab those values as the first thing using notification. I'm going to say, depending upon the code that was passed through, uh, remember that th there are these, uh, and these are actually, I think, defined in the hub uh, somewhere, but uh, uh, am I being notified of a new message or am I being notified that something's been done? Uh, if it's a new message, then I'm going to go ahead and receive that message. And you'll notice that I'm passing through the notify parameter, which happens to be the message number, the message ID. So I could actually do this here. I can say message ID. I think that makes more sense. I think that reads a little better. Uh, so it says, please receive message into my local copy of the message. And if that worked, then I want to call myself to handle the message. Now, in this base class, there's nothing. You know, handle message is empty. It's an empty virtual. Same thing with handle message done. But because when you derive this class in your actual worker, your actual manager, you can say, I care about handling messages. I care about handling message done.
or you may not. You know, as I say, if you have a manager that it just throws balls over the fence and doesn't care if they ever come back, then it maybe doesn't bother to derive handle message done because it never expects to hear back. So th th that's how you get the flexibility in there with that. So it's basically coming in saying, is it a new message or is it a message done? Uh, and if it's a new message, then it goes ahead and receives the message based on the message ID that was passed. And it says, I'm now going to handle that message, which of course is called up to the derived virtual method. Same situation, if the message is done, I'm going to, and I'm using the same method here, this receive message, but now I'm going to call instead handle message done. So it's a similar, similar kind of concept. Uh, and other than that, it, uh, this little take event does nothing. So it's just a nice simple little concept. When you're sending a message, you'll notice that, um, and actually there's something, this is interesting, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll comment on this now. The hub. The hub is what's referred to as a singleton. Uh, not only that, the hub is actually a utility class. Uh, if we take a look in, let's just go here, da, 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 back to here. We took a quick look at this class, but I want you to notice something about this class. Nothing but methods. There is no data. In fact, I want to just make a, I want to make a note here. Um, do not add any class properties. Uh, this is a utility class. Okay. A utility class, we, we don't strictly have this as a concept in Clarion, at least not as a named thing. Uh, if you are in C Sharp, for example, uh, you can have uh, a utility class, and basically a utility class is one that has only methods and no data. And the nice thing about a utility class is you don't have to instantiate it because it's never referring to self dot something of mine. It's saying self dot do this procedure that I happen to be responsible for, but that procedure is never going to reference an object's data. Therefore, um, you can uh, essentially instantiate this thing as many times as you want, uh, and it's always going to be calling the exact same uh, methods, the code itself, but it's never got any local data that it needs to worry about. So you'll see that inside of my message handler here, I've said, I want a threader hub. Now, is that suggests that the threader hub is here. And no, it's, it's, it's not here. It's just saying, I am going to call the class methods that are in the hub. And I didn't want to have to go to the trouble of passing around a reference to a hub to everybody when they were instantiated and making sure that was all handled properly. So by using a singleton and using a utility class, uh, I was actually I'm not. It's not even really a singleton. It really is just a utility class. Uh, but the, there is a single instance of data uh, where everything happens within the hub. So all I'm using when I define this hub here is just a local module object that doesn't have any data, that just is able to call the hub's methods. Uh, and the neat thing is when you actually look inside of the hub, you'll see that at the top of the hub, we've got a whole bunch of is dead. Okay, I've been, I'm on my way out of being killed. But there's, a, there's another little class here. Uh, and this is not a class type. So this is a real class that's happening inside this module. And here's some more module data. You'll notice there's no thread attribute on any of these things. Here's the message queue. Uh, here's another class. There's the critical procedure. So this is the way the hub is going to manage internally all of its synchronization. So I've got this hub that is the central repository of everything that's happening. Um, and because everything is going through this hub, it can manage all of this data as local, mo as local module data. It's not really accurate to call it local module data because it really is global within that module. Uh, so every single procedure, uh, the method procedure in here, all of the methods of these other classes that I'm defining, here's some more classes. Um, here's the critical procedure, here's the synchronization object itself. Um, all of that stuff is handled within the hub. It's, it's uh, quite handy of doing that. Um, 
And uh, Simon says, is there any danger of Mike showing this in action? I actually will shortly. Um, uh, we'll uh, at the very least take a look at our at our critical si our, our unit tests and we'll take a look at the little demo program that I created for uh, for DevCon. So, but I just wanted to just comment that every single one of these handlers, anytime I want to refer to the hub, I can just say, yeah, I just need to talk to the hub. So I'm just going to instantiate my utility class and call it directly. Uh, it's not quite the same as utility class in C-sharp, but it's essentially the same concept. Um, so da, 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 what else can I, uh, note running, all it does is it just says, oh, I'm just going to take note of my thread. Again, doesn't really matter because it's always going to be that. Uh, I'm going to tell the hub that I have been added as a handler. And you remember when we were instantiating the, uh, the worker, it said, I'm adding a handler, but it added that extra parameter of a manager, which really just said, oh, and by the way, you already know about me, but I've got a manager. Um, and, uh, and then it just updates that handler too. Uh, take event, what else here? Send message, a signal message done uh, again. Uh, these uh, th these are more just wrappers, so that I didn't have to worry in all of my uh, all the places we're using this. I didn't want to have to start instantiating the hub all over the place just so I could call its little send methods. Uh, so I said, okay, well we'll have a little send message method here, the receiver thread, the message you're sending, and that, and it just goes ahead and it just says. Yeah, if we made that parameter, then call it with the parameter emitted. Otherwise, call it with all three parameters. Real Are you really going to run this app? Yeah, absolutely. For well, sure. that's what Simon says. Yeah, yeah, I just... Yeah, I, 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 this. Yeah, well, I'm going to do that for sure. Uh, really? Absolutely. Yeah, well, yeah, for sure. Okay, okay so I want to just close on some of these things here. Uh, da, 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 da. Okay, then let's take one final look at this little guy here. Because this is the... the um, a worker, uh, this is a manager, different from a worker. So you'll notice suddenly I'm a manager, so maybe I care about what workers I've got. Uh, and because I've got this internal queue, I have to make sure it gets instantiated and, and, and allocated at runtime when this thing comes into in context. I have to be able to add workers, close workers, delete workers, fetch workers. So I have all this stuff where I need to manage workers. So I'm not going to delve into all the details of that. And you'll notice that there is a worker queue for managing all the threads. But the nice thing about that is the manager is able to do again it's just a, a message handler just like the worker is but it does more than just message handling so it's able to do everything a message handler can and this other managerial stuff as well and the really neat thing is if you wanted to a manager can also be a worker so you could have middle managers yay <laughs> all right now let's take a look at our uh, demo app running and just to, to get a sense as to, to what goes on here. So what I've got, let's just go ahead and hit the, the big button and see if it, I was touching a lot of code. We'll see if I broke something along the way. Cool. So let's call a manager. Bang. And uh, you know what? I, 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 I have here two buttons I want I've got two workers I'm going to manage um, and in this particular example I, I'm not doing an indiscriminate number of workers I just chose to just say I just I'm gonna have two workers I'm gonna have worker A and worker B and that's it and I'm gonna manage them when I start up worker A it's going to start another thread and he appears and the neat thing that it does is it says okay I now know that that workers was going it sort of says hey I want to send some message over there it this bit, uh, unhid this button so we could see that to send that message but it didn't actually do that and you'll notice I can't click on this because I think it's got the toolbox attribute um, but the um, the neat thing here is that as soon as it started it it immediately sent it a message to say hey here's where I want you to go based upon where this button is positioned because if I start this guy he shows up there so as soon as it starts it, and we can go and take a look at the code here in a second, as soon as it starts it, it immediately says, oh, and as soon as you get up and running, I want you to go to this position. So when I wrote this worker, I wrote it with the understanding that I'm going to hide it as soon as it shows up because I know the manager is going to tell me where to appear. And the whole process ends up happening that the thread, the worker thread starts. Uh, this thing then immediately sent a message to the hub to say, hey, tell that worker where to show, where to appear. 
The hub says, fine, I can't do that yet because the worker's not really running yet. I've told him to run, We've the, the, the thread's been started, but his window's not open yet, so I'm going to hold this message for now. Eventually, the, the, the worker's window does open, and it says to the hub, hey, uh, you can note that I'm running now. And the, the hub says, that's great, because I've got this message for you. Here's where I want, want you to appear. And the worker says, oh, good. I expected that message. I will now adjust my window position and then unhide myself so I show up in the right place. So this is wonderful, complex little interaction going on back and forth here. But when you look at the code that we wrote to make it work, it's really very small. Uh, and then we've got this single place. We can just type in a message. I'm going to send that to A. And then I'm going to do something else and send that to B. And then uh, I could start up another manager if I wanted to. Let's put this manager over here. A and B. And then send that. And send this. And then if I decide to close one of these managers, you'll notice that the workers disappear as well. So all of this is coordinated. But the amount of code necessary to do this is actually quite small. And we're going to take a look at that, and that's where we're going to end for today. I think we'll skip the unit tests for now. Uh, they're pretty uh, uh, dry uh, in, terms of, uh, in terms of functionality. They're more just to, to prove that the functionality worked, but I, I will describe them at one point because it, uh, in a future webinar because it's worthwhile seeing the way you have to write unit tests when you're doing multi-threaded development. That's probably the trickiest thing in the whole process, which is why I don't want to get into it in too much depth today. So let's take a look at our manager window. Oops. I really wish Clarion would not try and make everything line up with that procedure prompt. Uh, okay, so here is my th threader manager. So this is the, the kind of class I'm going to drive from. And note that I want to handle a message being sent. And you're saying, you might be saying, wait a second, why do you want to handle a message? Aren't you a manager? you want to handle knowing that a message has been processed. Well, uh, I decided that if a person closed the worker, let's take a look at that here. I can start a manager and I can open a worker. Now, if I close, you'll note that when the manager did that, it opened up this button here. It unhid the button so you could send stuff to it. But what if I come along and say, I want you to go away? I want it to go away. So the worker, if you happen to close it, I decided I want to send a message back to the manager to say, hey, I just closed. So the manager goes, oh, great, thanks. I'll, I'll deal with that. So that's why this thing is derived here, this particular message, because it's expecting the possibility of the manager, of a worker saying he's closed. Um, this is our worker class because we have two of them. Why would I write the code twice? I'm going to write a class to do it once. The worker will have a name, either A or B. Uh, it has a button to start it. It has a button to update it, um, and it has a thread that it got started on. And this is, I have three methods here. I want to tell it to close uh, because I could, again, I, I've got a, a fair bit of flexibility. Let's say when I'm running this thing and I say, I want you to start. Oh, you know what? Stop. Start. Stop. So I want it to be able to tell it to close and when I press the button. I want to be, I want to handle that the worker did stop. And then I've got my own little take event because I wanted to, to do some additional stuff. I can't remember what it was I wanted to do. And then here is my worker A deriving from that class and my worker B. And each of those just has a very simple construct method because all they need to do is initialize these variables because they differ from one to the next. So where's A and B here? Oh, here we go. Here's A and B. Where it just says, here's my name, here's my start button, here's my update button. Uh, if we take a look at, uh, at all of this extra stuff it does here, it's pretty standard Clarion code. And da, 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 da. When the manager handles the message, is, if the message code is signal that the worker is closed, uh, which is an equate that I defined, and I said this is a code that's meaningful to me because this is just information. I'm not passing through data in this, in this particular message. I'm just passing through a code saying if the code that was sent to me was, hey, the worker's closed, then I want to, um, depending upon uh, which message, and remember, the message has the sender thread. So depending upon who talked to me, was it A? Was it A's thread or was it B's thread? Because if it was A, then I have to handle the fact that A has stopped. 
if it's B, I have to handle the fact that B stopped. So that's handling the message. And remember, again, this is a derived method. Well, I didn't have to worry about calling this at the appropriate time. I just knew that a message was going to be tossed into me. I'm just saying, hey, I got a message. What's it going to be? Um, when I want to tell a worker to close, it just says if the worker's thread is not zero, meaning it's open right now, then I want to set, you know, so I got a message here again, I'm going to pass through a message. So I'm going to say, hey, worker, I want a signal that you're closing now versus it's actually worker closed. So these are two little codes that I define in my program that are meaningful in my messages. Uh, and then I'm going to tell the manager uh, to uh, to pass along a message uh, to the to my thread. I want you to pass through this message that uh, that I'm uh, that I want you to close. So that's how I'm just telling it to close. It's just passing through this very simple message. Uh, when the worker gets in a uh, uh, take event, uh, da, 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 da. so what we're doing here is um, uh, this is where it's watching the first button. So it's saying, okay, was a button accepted? And if it was, was it my start button? Am I closed right now? Because if I'm closed, then I need to, I need to open myself up. And it goes through and it automatically sets the position. It, it automatically creates, you'll notice there's a message here again, because as soon as I start the worker, where am I starting them here? Da, 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 da. I'm starting it somewhere. Da, 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 da. Start thread accepted. Start effect. Uh, oh, this isn't take event, so it's automatically. No, no, this is for the for that. Okay. Oh, no. Oh, no I must be starting it here somewhere. Manager send message and hide. Uh, tell the close handle stop. Oh, I must be calling this. The where am I calling start from? I'm curious now. Oh, right here. I didn't even see it. I'm blind. Um, so this is my thread. Um, for my window properties, remember that we want to pass more than just a string. So I'm going to say, um, I, I want to pass through this information of here's the caption I want you to have. I want you to have your name in the title bar. And I want you to set your X position based upon my position plus the position of the button that started you. And I want to set your, white to be, your Y position to be my position plus my height plus an extra little bit. And I set the code to say I'm signaling it on the worker open. So that's another message code. And I'm setting the data to be the stuff that's in P, which is all this stuff. So I'm passing all of this through in the string, uh, in, in, in the data string, and I'm setting the code as well. So I'm passing through both values at this point. And I'm sending through that message to the thread that was just started. And then I go ahead and I unhide my button and I change the text on the starting button to say now you could use that same button to stop it if you want. And note again that that same button that starts and stops. So if, the, if it's currently not running, then it says start it. But if it is running, it says, well, now I need to tell it to close and I want you to handle the fact that, uh, that it's stopped. So telling it to close is, uh, where is it? Telling it to close, here's telling it to close is up here. It says if there's no thread, then just send through the close request. I think we looked at this a second or so ago. Um, and then handle stopped, it just says, I no longer have a worker on thread A or B. Um, hide the, the button that will let me send through a message because I can't because he's dead and change the text on my button. So, uh, so this is everything the manager does. Nothing too fancy there. As I say, it's, it's a lot of this, these little derived methods here, like this little handle message here. And then the fact that I had some fairly complex user interface stuff that I wanted to happen. I wanted it to look a little bit slick in terms of pushing these buttons and having the text appear and disappear and all that stuff. So most of the complexity was in the, the whole management of the window and not the messaging itself. The messaging itself was very straightforward. Now, if we take a look at the worker win window, You'll see in this case, he's defining a worker class, not a manager class. Um, told to close. Uh, this is just a, a Boolean variable to say, was I told to close by my manager? Because if the user closes me uh, and not the manager, I want to respond differently. Because if the user told me to close, then I have to tell the manager that, uh, that, uh, that somebody closed me. But if the manager told me to close, then I don't need to bother sending a message back saying, hey, I just closed because you told me to close, of course. Uh, construct a handle message and tell manager that we're closing. 
So these are very straightforward. Construct just says, here's who my manager thread is. Um, and I probably could have just said, well, you know what, I think, I, I wonder, yeah. Yeah, I think in this case, because the worker I cared about the manager thread, then I saved it. Uh, but you could have a worker that doesn't care. So in this case, I said, yes, I do want to care and, and take note of that. Uh, when we handle a message, uh, this is the message coming from the manager now. There are uh, three different messages that could be coming through, uh, depending upon the code. It could be on worker opening, I need to get some data. So you'll notice that here's this worker window props, which is a group that I define in global, a group type that I define in my global to say I can pass this as a, as a message information block back and forth. So this is the same kind of thing. So the first thing I do is I say I want to grab the string value and pump it into that group so I can now access the caption and the xpos and the ypos directly from that. And then once I'm doing all that, now I can unhide myself. Did they send through some text you want to display? And if so, then go ahead and put that data, whatever the string was, is now being passed through on that same message data. Same thing coming through, so it goes ahead and sets it. And then was I just told to close by my manager? Well, in that case, I'm going to remember that I was told to close, and then I'm going to ask myself to close. And you'll notice up... Uh, let's take one more look here. This is the take event. So there we call the workers take event. And then we say, oh, um, if the if I'm getting an event close window and the worker was not told to close, then I'm going to tell the manager uh, that, that I was being closed. And uh, as far as I'm concerned, this doesn't belong here. This goes back, should go down to the workers. No, we don't have a worker take event. Uh, okay, well, that's why it's there. Uh, so we're calling the workers take event. We could have derived the workers take event and then called self dot take event and then put this stuff in the workers derive take event, but that's pretty much the, the same concept. Uh, it really depends on whether or not you want to see this code up here. I, I, I will admit I don't like seeing code like this lost up here in amongst all the event processing stuff. So perhaps I will derive that real quick here. So we're going to add, uh, what do we want here? That guy. I just want to make sure I get, oops. I want to get the same, uh, oh, it's not that one. It's going to be it's in the base class. Uh -huh. Oops, did it again. There. So take event. I want to make sure I get the exact same definition from that. Uh, so we'll go back to our app. And we're going to take event, but this is going to be derived. So I want to create my own take event method. And we'll come back down here and we'll put it here. Uh, byte return value equals self or parent dot take event and then we're going to say that other stuff where was it here that and then event is a closed window and not self told to close then self tell manager closing and the interesting thing is that now that we've got that we probably could just get rid of this thing altogether. Put this, oh, actually, you know what? Uh, what I'm more likely to do, even though this is only two lines, I like the fact that it's got all this data and code together. So I could just leave it as a method like that. There's nothing wrong with that. But I am sorely tempted, and I think I will do it, to change this to a little local routine of this because it doesn't have any meaningful purpose outside of the context of this one call needing to be here. So I think I'm just going to say do tell manager closing and I'll have routine and now it's got data there. And then of course I have to get rid of this because this thing doesn't really have any purpose outside of this one little method here. 
and, and I like to encapsulate stuff like this as much as possible um, because it, it just helps sort of clarify sort of the big story. When you're up here looking at these things, you go, what's this tell manager closing thing? Why is it up here? Am I calling it in seven places? No, I'm just doing it in this one spot. But I like encapsulating the fact that this thing as a task is all of that stuff, including the data and everything else. I, I could have just copied these two lines of code up here and replaced that, but then I'd have to, have to take that line of code and put it up here, and then it's like, hold on, wait, what is this thing doing? It's doing a bunch of stuff. It's calling a parent. It's calling this. It's doing all these checks. Um, uh, so the uh, I think it works a little better like this, personally. And with that, I'm going to call this done uh, for the day. This I, I fully expect it to not get through everything. Uh, it's a very large topic, um, and I think it was, uh, it was worthwhile sort of looking at sort of how we can create uh, sort of a little messaging concept as, as an abstract idea uh, and then uh, and then make use of it in a very simple little example uh, I want to take a look in the future at some point at uh, at a few more examples and uh, and uh, and see how we can put this up in place possibly even create a template uh, to uh, to do some of the work for us so we don't have to manually do all the derivations and such things like that maybe prompt the person to say you know do you want to you know, handle messages. Do you want to handle notifications that something's done? And then it would automatically have a little template button that would take you to the explicit point uh, in the embeds uh, rather than having to go hunting for it and typing a lot of code in. Because I know people generally don't like typing a lot of code uh, and this uh, this class stuff can get a little bit uh, odd at times. So, uh, so I think it's worthwhile for us to extend this with a template to make this kind of thing a little bit easier. Um, and I, I do recognize uh, that uh, that there is in the in the ultimate utilities there is a notification template, but it doesn't have quite the same focus as this. I think it, its purpose is more just to handle notification events in, as a generic concept, whereas this is more the whole concept of having worker threads and everything else, which also does make use of uh, of, uh, of various different messages and such things. So we do make use of notification in a similar fashion. But the focus of it is is uh, substantially different because of the of the focus on worker and manager threads and such. So, do you concur, John, or do you see this as being a whole lot of uh, repetition of ideas? I just can't believe you're competing with ultimate I, stuff. <laughs> hey, I, I don't know if you've uh, if you've noticed, but uh, if you CL for Clarion Live. Oh, I like that. Okay, you guys so, take over so the CL. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I don't think it's com competing. We can make well, you, should, you should derive ultimate notify into there. So you can yeah, and, and and that is a potential thing I could do is is uh, is take a look at. Uh, I didn't look really closely at how the ultimate notify handled its stuff. Uh, the part of part of my concern, if you recall, is uh, when you have a message here. Um, is there's all of there are all of these meta variables and these meta variables in the message were, were pretty important uh, to uh, to handling all of that stuff and with the hub handling messages and handling workers and all these other things uh, I didn't really see uh, we'll, we'll take that's, it might be a good thing we might have to take a look at because ultimately I don't want to I don't want to reinvent the wheel um, if we can make use of that and uh, and then just reduce the amount of code in here that's good but you'll notice that I don't have a very much code that's involved with notification most of my code is involved in in sort of managing threads right. uh, so it's uh, it's a little bit different focus Simon is saying here uh, always Okay, can't keep up with this. <laughs> Thank you, Simon. Um, but uh, he says he's got an interthread communication protocol class as well uh, that has become his go-to. Um, and, and I would love to see your stuff, Simon, because uh, the, the, the thing that I noticed about my thing is as I kept writing it, I kept thinking of more stuff that it had to do. So there are a couple of bits and bobs in there that cannot, um, uh, th th that are either 
partially implemented or things that were just kind of little sparkles in my head that now at some point in time I'm going to run into this problem and we're going to have to extend it to do that. Uh, so uh, I would like to have a single thing that handles sort of as many of these things as possible. So uh, so I'd, li I'd be curious to see the kinds of issues you dealt with yourself, Simon, and uh, and then maybe incorporate that, incorporate the, you know, the ultimate notification thing. You know, it, it, it's great if we can if we can kind of share our brains together and uh, and uh, come up with a solution that uh, solves all of the problems that we can think of as a uh, as a, a massive conflux of people trying to deal with the same sort of issues on a daily basis there you go so what yeah, what's next? I would like that I would like that Mike because I just like to build my data dictionary and just compile <laughs> all these features like come oh, in well, I, I don't know if it'll ever get quite to that point because you have to have you actually have to write a worker to do something. Oh man! Don't so read his thing. <laughs> you gotta write some some code. Yeah, at some point you're gonna have to uh, do something more than just define your data files. Sorry. All sorry. right. All right. All right. <laughs> so, that being the case, we gotta wrap it up, John. Two minutes. We do. Well, Simon's putting himself out here to, to do some uh, presenting. Oh, I'm looking yes, forward to working with Simon funny. to do that. Simon says he wants to work with Mike. That would work. You guys get together and let us know. For sure. All right. There you go. Works for me. Okay. So I, I don't know when you had time again, Mike, to follow up on this. Uh, I could probably do it next Friday. Uh, the, uh, if, if, if we've got an opening then, I could certainly uh, continue this little would, series. Would you rather do it contiguously or do you need uh, a break in between? Given, given the complexity of it, I, I think it would make sense not to pause too long from one session to the next because uh, our brains will just not fathom it. And as it is, I think it's it's a pretty lofty topic. Uh, so it might be worthwhile to continue on for the time being. And since we don't have anybody booked in for those times yet, uh, it's probably worthwhile. So, so next All week, right. uh, to continue on, I think that'd be cool. Yeah. And then Bruce has an idea of, of, yeah. yeah, he does. And he could do that the following week, and then that brings us up to November 1st, and we've got that. And then, so there you go. We'd be all set. Yeah, we cool. were talking we, – on Wednesday, we were talking about cues in cues. And so he's thinking of exposing that deeply, more deeply. Cues and cues are a very neat thing. Mm -hmm. Especially when you're doing um, embedded or nested JSON files. Well, that that's it, and I'm curious to see because because I know he's trying to extend his, the the name property to allow uh, more meta information, and uh, and I suspect that may be what he's uh, he's tickling is, is that idea of uh, you know how do we automatically handle this uh, driving down concept? So I'm looking forward to it. Yeah. Okay. Right. Then. We'll wrap it up. Right at two hours. Yep, I'm glad we decided to make these any any length. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's just habit. Two hours, bing. Okay, but that's all right. It's good content, I think. So yeah. yes, it's very good. Excellent. Content. Yeah. Well okay. done. Well, thank you, Mike. Uh, again. Well, you're welcome. No problem. I think Andy's back next week, so I think there's a Noyantis thing. Um, We'll find out. If you get a notice, there is. If you don't, there isn't. And the uh, Wednesday open, normal time, and same with the net talk. So, normal week. Thanks, everybody. Bring Thank you, uh, Mike. And we'll see you guys around. See you Have next a great week. weekend. Bye, everybody. Bye bye, all. Hey, John. Yes. Bye. Have a great weekend. <laughs> bye. Talk to you later.